Okay, for our first panelist, our first panel session titled U.S. and Japanese Perspectives on the Japanese Economy, we are very uh, pleased to have a distinguished chair and moderator. His uh, bio, along with all the other bios of the uh, speakers, are in your program, so we're not going to go into too much detail, but he is the Assistant Professor of Political Science at the Bellarmine College of Liberal, Liberal Arts at Loyola Marymount University. Please welcome Dr. Gene Park. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, so far, we've already heard a little bit about uh, Abenomics and the uh, three arrows of his economic policy. It's something that's attracted a tremendous amount of t attention in Japan. Uh, bringing a certain degree of optimism and attracted attention in the U.S. and probably, arguably, the world as well. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, two experts who will discuss uh, Abe's economic policy. We uh, have two speakers. The first is Dr. Fukunari Kimura, who is professor of economics at Keio University in Japan, and he's also chief economist of the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia and uh, representative director of Tokyo Center for Economic Research. Uh, he's an expert uh, on trade negotiations and also economic integration in East Asia. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Richard Katz, who is the editor-in-chief of The Oriental Economist and also a special correspondent uh, for the weekly uh, Toyo Keizai uh, publication. Thank you. Please welcome, uh, please welcome Mr. Kamara. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you for the introduction, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to uh, make a presentation here. And also, I'd like to thank uh, sponsors and supporters for this meeting, too. Uh, yeah, uh, Rick uh, is a journalist. A journalist is good for criticism, of course. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's why he'd like to talk later. Okay. Um, I, I mainly talk about the TPP. Uh, at the beginning, I will talk about uh, Abenux very briefly and uh, try to show you a, a sort of positioning of TPP negotiation uh, in the framework of Abenomics. Um, Abenomics in the first year, as you see, we have three arrows, so-called. The first one is monetary policy. Uh, that is in the short run seems to uh, be pretty successful. At least uh, we are backing up to a sort of normal situation. Some people say that the Japanese economy is getting really, really good because of that. I have some doubt on that. At least we can come back to a sort of situation before uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, that would be a sort of fair uh, way to judge, judge on that. In the past uh, five, six years, uh, the, the expectation on the Japanese economy was so bad so th that's abnormally bad. So nobody would like to invest, actually. Uh, but so by doing this, uh, at least in a short, short run, in the first, first three, four months, uh, the first uh, foreign investors responded. Then after that, the domestic investors in responded. Then the finally, the real economy responded. So that's a sort of uh, uh, changes in the past one year. The second arrow, fiscal policy. As you see that uh, we have, uh, the Japanese government has a huge debt, more than 200% of uh, the, uh, one year's uh, uh, GDP. Uh, this is much, much higher than Greece or okay. Italy or somewhere. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we really have a sort of really serious situation for a sort of fiscal situation. Uh, but the one, uh, one thing is that 93% of uh, government debt is held by Japanese. So it's a sort of, a, the creditors are also Japanese. So it's a sort of borrowing and lending among Japanese. Uh, and so uh, it, it's a sort of an intergenerational, intergenerational income distribution. Old guys are spending too much money, and the young guys have to pay back. <laughs> uh, that, that's a really serious uh, problem. So still, uh, we may have a sort of instability in prices of uh, treasury bonds. Uh, then everybody would hurt. So, so that is a really serious situation. At least uh, um, uh, the government is successfully uh, passed the law that uh, so consumption tax should be increased from 5% 5, 5 to 8% in coming uh, April, and in the next year probably to 10%. So uh, this is at least they have to do. 
Uh, but some simulation says that in order to clear up all the government debts, probably we have to raise up consumption tax, tax up to 18% and 20%. So, so just uh, 8 or 10%, this is just the beginning uh, to clear up those kind of debts. So, but, but they did that. Uh, then the third ar arrow, so this is a sort of uh, things uh, now at, at uh, sort of in discussion how far Japan can make a sort of reform. Uh, the U.S. people, uh, American people like reform, uh, but the reform uh, has been, uh, ha has not been a kind of really popular word for Japanese politicians in the past, uh, in the long, long period actually. Uh, but in, uh, in Abenomics at least uh, they like to do something. Uh, something related to the government regulations like uh, electricity, uh, labor market, uh, or medical sciences. Uh, those are obviously we have to do something. But in a kind of core part of uh, uh, the Japanese economy, like a sort of usual corporate activities and others, how far we could do that, this is a one uh, thing that we have to think of. The Abenomics is coming in, uh, sorry, uh, TPP is coming in here. Uh, one is, of course, a, a TPP negotiation uh, encourages uh, some reform in, in Japan. Say it's, uh, ag agriculture is uh, certainly a sort of one of the symbolic thing. But, but of course, the agriculture sector is not a huge, huge sector anymore in, J in Japan, only 1.3% of GDP. So it's very symbolic and also the politically very, uh, very tough to go through. Uh, but uh, and this is a symbolic. So it's not really a sort of. Uh, encouraging a sort of re, a whole recovery of the Japanese economy. But one important thing is that many Japanese feels that the, the, the betterment of uh, policy environment outside of Japan, particularly in East Asia, uh, this is extremely important for the Japanese economy. Uh, so this is a sort of story that how uh, Japanese uh, would, would be convinced that the TPP is important. Uh, this is just uh, uh, exchange rates, just backing up to the level of 2008. Uh, the stock prices, again, uh, just backing up to the, the level of 2008. So it's a sort of a normalization process. That this is a sort of uh, uh, my, my interpretation of Abenomics in the first year. So uh, why, why TPP for Japan and also East Asia? Uh, so I, I would show us the public polls and actually, uh, the supporters of a TPP are always in majority compared with a sort of opponents. You would be surprised, actually, to see a sort of figures. Um, then why, why Japanese are supporting uh, the TPP negotiations? My interpretation is that uh, uh, they know that uh, the production networks, particularly in the manufacturing sector, extended in East Asia, uh, regarded as a sort of source of competitiveness of Japanese firms. And also, actually, that kind of uh, globalizing activities of corporate firms uh, generating domestic employment, too. So this is a sort of a basis of why uh, many Japanese support uh, TPP negotiation. Uh, this is a pub public poll, re uh, uh, quite a recent one. FNN is uh, one of the, the uh, TV broadcasting company, and they did uh, some phone, uh, phone interviews. Uh, the question was, uh, do you support Japan's participation in TPP uh, that will substantially uh, liberalize trade with Asia-Pacific countries uh, with tariff removals in principle? Uh, including agriculture. And you see that the yes and the 60%, then the no, uh, 32%. Um, uh, this is one example, and actually we have multiple uh, public polls in the past, past two, three years, and always a yes is uh, larger than no. Uh, so this is a, a sort of public polls. You see, that if you go to the bookstore in Japan, then you can see that the opponents wrote a lot of books, uh, 30 books or something. I, I'm one of the proponents, and the proponents' books are maybe five or six or seven. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but you see that people know that this is a very important initiative. Um, the reason is that uh, now we are having uh, the international pr division of labor. Uh, it's in the quite different from in the past. In the past, uh, so this is uh, based on uh, the, the article by Richard Baldwin, 
uh, of the University of Geneva, he said that in a, uh, we, we were in, in, the, in the era of so-called the first unbundling, industry by industry division of labor. This country has a lot of capital. This country has a lot of labor. This country, country is in high tech. This country is low tech. That decides uh, uh, the so-called comparative advantage. Uh, then we have uh, industry by industry division of labor. We had so-called first unbundling, oh, sorry, um, this unbundling of production and consumption. Production is done in one country, then the consumption is done in another country. So this is so-called first unbundling. Uh, here, so actually trade is basically uh, so raw materials and also uh, uh, finished products trade. So. So the, the monetary cost of uh, trade was very, very important. But at the time cost doesn't really matter. So we can make, make it very slow. But now, uh, after, after the, the 1980s, we had the ICT revolution. Then we are coming into the era of so-called the second unbundling. Then here, uh, we have the international division of labor in terms of production processes or tasks. So then here's actually not just a monetary transport cost, but the time cost and the reliability of uh, logistics links, those are extremely important. So, and, and at the same time, say, say one country has some task, another country has another task. So we have to have a very close coordination. What sort of uh, function can be uh, moved to China, moved to Malaysia or Singapore? And then uh, the, the domestic investment, investment climate for each country, this is particularly important. So those kind of things are coming in particularly for newly developed economies and developing countries. So, so the TPP is actually a part of it to, to set up a sort of a set of policies uh, that, that really needs this, this type of a new international division of labor. So we are not just talking about uh, tariffs, uh, uh, the, the former presenter said that uh, the uh, tariffs are sort of 19th century uh, stuff. Uh, still, still, we have to think of uh, take, take care of uh, leftover tax uh, tariffs. But actually, we are talking about uh, more uh, deeply that uh, sort of policies in order to support uh, the, a sort of globalization era. So. Uh, then actually that generates a sort of a development strategies for developing countries because uh, now they can start out industrialization much, much easier than uh, under the first unbundling. Under, under the first unbundling, they have to raise up the whole in the industry. So it takes time and it costs a lot. But, but now, they just invite some production blocks in the second down boundary. They can jump start industrialization. So the China and also Southeast Asian countries did that. They can really start accelerate the, the first half of industrialization. Uh, so this is, this is so very good for uh, developing countries too. And, and at the same time, um, uh, the formation of agglomeration is coming in too. So they, they do some, in, division of labor across unrelated firms. Unrelated firms' transactions are always in short distance in many cases. So, so that generates industrial agglomeration too. So you can see in China and also the, the Southeast Asian countries, the formation of agglomeration is going on. At the same time, uh, we have a, a fragmentation of production too. So that completely changes the development strategies of uh, newly developed and developing countries. So this is a sort of background uh, why they are supporting uh, the, the, the setup of uh, international rule. Just skip here, sorry. Uh, the, this is uh, actually the machinery industry is a sort of champion of this kind of international division of labor. Uh, because uh, one machine has many parts and components uh, so they, they are naturally having a sort of a division of labor across countries, across firms. So, so if you just pick up, oh sorry, pick up uh, the proportion of machinery uh, exports and imports out of total exports and imports, uh, you can see on the left hand side, uh, those countries are doing uh, exporting and also importing uh, machineries. So they are doing a sort of division of labor inside machineries. So on the left hand side, uh, right hand side, still they are doing a sort of first unbundling. Basically, machinery industries are not there. 
uh, they are just importing machines or importing parts and components and assemble and, se assemble and sell to the local market. So, so you can see uh, in this kind of type of uh, international division of labor, some countries can do, some countries cannot do. So not just the wage levels are those kind of things. So, so that's why they, they have to have a good investment uh, climate and also good logistics links, including time, cost, and reliability. So that is coming, that, that is a sort of, sort of a reason why we really need international rules and there's a new level of liberalization in order to support uh, this type of uh, international division of labor. And the, from the viewpoint of developed countries like uh, Japan uh, or US, uh, the important thing is, of course, uh, domestic employment. Uh, this is very important in Japan too. But you can see that this is uh, based on uh, some regression results. Uh, the, the contents are a bit uh, technical, sorry for that. But this is very important. So that, that's why I'd like to show this. Uh, uh, I, I used uh, the firm level data uh, for the Japanese manufacturing, manufacturing firms. Uh, some, some firms have uh, f foreign affiliates in East Asia, uh, some are not. And then, so we just, I, I just classify that the, some countries are increasing the number of affiliates in East Asia. Some countries are just keep the same number of affiliates. Some countries are reducing the number of affiliates. And, and the base is uh, domestic firms uh, who, who, who do not have uh, foreign affiliates in East Asia. Then uh, check uh, the change in domestic uh, employment uh, during the period 1998, 2002, 2002 to 2006, 2007 to 2009. Then uh, this is a sort of regression analysis, so, so, so using a sort of controls like a size, a firm size, uh, R&D ratios and others. Then uh, uh, after all, what we got is, uh, say, to 1998 to 2002, uh, firms that increases the number of uh, affiliates is actually uh, generating domestic employment by 4.3% uh, compared with domestic firms. So uh, same thing happens in 2002 to 2006, uh, actually 6.6% in addition to uh, the domestic firms. Now what, what I'm so saying is that actually uh, firms that extends the, the operation in East Asia, uh, engaging in uh, production networks, are uh, actually generating domestic employment in Japan. So some people say that the sort of internationalization, globalization of corporate activities, uh, say one, one factory is labor intensive, so they just uh, scrap this factory, lay off people, and move out. But it's not happening actually in Japan. Uh, if once we have a sort of division of labor in terms of pr production processes and tasks, uh, and actually the expansion of uh, operation abroad generates domestic employment in developed countries. So many Japanese people feel this, actually. I did this kind of presentation everywhere in uh, local, local places in Japan, too. Uh, then actually, the idea of a globalization of a corporate firms, that is supported by everybody, not just big firms, multinationals, but uh, small and medium enterprises support that. Local governments support that, and also labor unions support that too. So, so this is a sort of atmosphere why they, need, they think that TPP is important. Actually, TPP is a very important step to set, uh, set up good international rules. So how is the TPP negotiation changing Japan? Uh, one is uh, the agriculture, of course. And so already uh, the former uh, pre presenter talked about that. Some sign of a reform in agricultural uh, protection. So, uh, but so at, at least uh, the, the level of uh, tariff removal changes uh, from so-called 85 percent to say 95 percent or so. Uh, so this is a sort of sign of a uh, changing, and this is not enough actually in order to uh, get conclusion of TPP. But but you can you can see a sort of changes over there. Um, and also, uh, actually, the, the progress of TPP negotiation is accelerating other mega FTA negotiation too. So the Japan is engaging uh, so R RCEP, this is ASEAN plus six FTA, and also CJK, uh, China, Japan, Korea FTA, Japan, EU FTA. 
uh, those are actually accelerated because of uh, the TPP negotiation. So, so, so TPP uh, membership is uh, still limited, but actually that, that, that has a lot of impact to uh, non-members members too. So conclusion, so uh, our common mission, common, common between say Japan, uh, US, and probably some other Asia Pacific countries, establishing a, a new international economic order uh, in order to uh, serve for a new international division of labor, uh, say the second unbundling. This is a very important mission to do that. And, and, cons and, and I think that the cons we have consider considerable probability for Japan to overcome uh, 19th century's uh, homework uh, to, uh, to, to step into uh, the closer to the conclusion of TPP. Uh, so that, of course, the last, uh, uh, last issue is uh, how uh, U.S. politics can overcome this. But uh, the Japan has to do our homework before that. Thank you very much. So, is it up there? Hmm. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Rick. I'm a chartaholic, and I'm not of the reforming type. I'm the an unreformed chartaholic, but I'm trying. So I made a whole bunch of charts, but I'm not going to use them. Just only some of them, and we'll leave some for the Q and A. Um, uh, so Abenomics is based, as other speakers have said, on the uh, idea of these three arrows monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus to sort of lift the economy from its doldrums. And then the third arrow is structural reform so that instead of an economy that's able to only grow at a half a percent or one percent a year, one that could grow at two percent a year. And growth solves an awful lot of problems or at least makes them a lot more manageable. Now, if I really believed that Abe had all three arrows, and he was going to do them properly, then I would be extremely bullish about the revival of Japan. Unfortunately, I believe Abe has got about one and a quarter arrows. And I also believe that none of the arrows work without the other two. And so one just doesn't do it. The arrow he's got is this idea that somehow by printing money, printing lots of money, and creating inflation, that this will somehow lift spirits and lift confidence and get growth going again. And gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could solve all of our problems just by having the central bank print a lot of money? But it ain't the case. What is the case is that uh, while inflation has been, going, has been recovering in Japan, that is going from a, a falling prices to somewhat rising prices, virtually all of the increase in prices in Japan is due to a weaker yen, which means Japan pays more for imports. It pays more for oil. It pays more for the smartphones. It buys from Apple and Samsung. It pays more for clothing, etc. Now, if you look at the last two, 3,000, 4,000 years of economic history, I do not believe you can find a single case of a country that grew faster because it paid more for oil to the Arabs or more for smartphones to the Koreans. Um, I might be convinced you grow better by buying LNG from the Americans, but that would still be a tough case. So the problem is that when you end up, you basically you're transferring purchasing power from Japanese to these foreign exporters. That does not help Japan. And so one of the consequences is that real wages are falling in Japan. Those real wages means your wages taking into account inflation or deflation. And they've been falling, you know, for almost two decades now. And despite all the talk of Abe about the need to raise wages, and in fact, in the years since he's been in power, wages have fallen back to the second lowest level since the lost decades began in the early 1990s. So that's not going very well. That does not bode well for revival or growth. So that's what I've got to say about the first arrow. We can talk more about it in the Q&A if people want. On the second arrow, which is fiscal policy, that is government budgets, all I will say is that Abe has got his foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. And that ain't no way to drive a car. 
He's raising taxes, which of course, he's raising consumer taxes, which leaves people with less money to spend. How you get people to spend more by leaving them with less money to spend is a mystery that I've not been able to have solved. But somehow he thinks that's the case. So now we're spending more money on public works, but the people who benefit from the public works are not the people who are paying necessarily these taxes. So again, foot on the brake and accelerate at the same time. That is no way to drive a car or a country. So let me move to the third, the third arrow, which is the heart of what really you need for long-term revival. Now, the third arrow is really all about a productivity revolution. That's what you need in Japan. And I'm going to get to the tests of what I mean by a productivity revolution. But I would say there are two ways to look at the third arrow. That is, what are the feathers in what Abe has said is his third arrow? And are they real or are they fake feathers? So they say in Japan, the hone and tatamai, that is the, 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 the sort of the cover story, the official story, and then what's really going on. So some of these alleged reforms. But even more important, what are the kind of reforms that Japan needs? Is there, and is any of that even, even being discussed in Abe's third arrow, which I think is, is the bigger problem. But let's go to Japan's basic growth problem. <clears throat> and sorry for the economics, but hey, you know, I got trained in it. In any country, growth is a combination of how many workers do you have, how many hours are they working every year, and how much more can they produce in each hour. So if the number of hours that all the workers put together is growing by, let's say, 1% a year, and each worker can produce 2% more in that hour than they did the year before, 1 plus 2 gives you 3% growth. That's good. Right? And 2% growth per person, which is really good because that means your living standard is growing. Problem in Japan is because of the aging of the population, the demographics, the doldrums, etc. the number of hours, which is the, whoop, which, which, ah, here you go, the hours in black here, right? That's been declining for the last two decades. It's about 10% lower than it's been in 1990. So the only source of growth is this gray area of overall GDP growth, which is growth in that productivity. How much more can each worker produce per hour? And that's where Japan's really fallen down. And it's way, way behind global standards and a whole number of industries, the majority of the economy with a few global industries that are exceptions, say like automobiles, for example. And the productivity revolution in the 1990s and 2000s is quite, what a really big, big part of America's revival. It's what Japan needs. So that's what the third arrow's got to be about. Now, all right. So let's talk about the tests, three, three tests to look about whether is Abenomics a real deal or is it all false advertising? Well, one issue we've discussed is the TPP, which is basically a mechanism to, to increase the globalization of the Japanese economy. In virtually every case where you look around the world, where countries have gone to, to have successful reform and really growth revival, in almost every single case, whether it be China or Korea or Poland or, or the United States or whoever, increased globalization, by which I mean increased trade, increased foreign direct investment has been part of the recipe because globalization knocks down the cozy cartels, the vested interests that block progress at home. They're not part of the club. They turn over tables. It's a good thing. It creates what Schumpeter called creative destruction. All right? Now, the whole world is becoming, or I shouldn't say the whole world, I mean, the whole world, but not every country in the world, has becoming more globalized, more interdependent over the last few decades. So we see here, and I'm sorry to those over there, I'm turning my head here, but here's where I can point the laser. So if we look over here, we see, oh, wait, that, uh, here we go. This is at the world level, this gray line. And we see the ratio of trade to GDP has gone way up from about 30% to 60%. So it's doubled over the last you know, five decades, right? Now, this is India, which started off very, very low. This is Korea, 
which also started off low and is really, really zoomed. I'm using Korea and India as comparisons because one's got a population much smaller than Japan, one's got a population much larger than Japan. And they've all went through trouble around the same time as Japan in the early 90s. They all try to launch reform programs around the same time. So it's a measure of relative success. And here's Japan in this black line, where basically the trade GDP ratio remained at 20%, didn't grow at all, except now in the last decade it's grown somewhat. So that's good. It means Japan's progressing. But compared to what's going on in the rest of the world, Japan is walking while everybody else is running. So if you look at the ratio of Japan's trade to GDP compared to the world average. And if, what you'll see is that, in fact, Japan has gone down from having an 80, a ratio equal to 80% of the world level down to about 50%. India, on the other hand, has zoomed way up, particularly after the reforms of the early 1990s. I didn't put Korea because they're like, they're way off the charts. They're just zooming ahead. And one of the reasons why they're being successful. Now, the other side is uh, what kind of globalization? I thought uh, Professor Kimura's presentation on unbundling was, was really, really fascinating. And, and, and conceptually, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think one of the problems of Japan is that it's not really taking advantage of the possibilities that are inherent in the unbundling. And here's why. Japan has what the trade ministry calls reverse imports, which is to say when when Panasonic or, or, or Toyota or whoever buys an import from Southeast Asia or East Asia, wherever, China, are they buying it from a totally independent indigenous producer? Or are they buying it from one of their own affiliates? If they're buying it from one of their own affiliates, they're not importing things that compete with Japanese producers at home. And it is competition that produces productivity. I heard a Korean trade minister say, you can't have competitiveness without competition. That should be emblazoned you know, on the, as the slogan for Abenomics. I don't know that Abe could actually even utter the sentence. Right? And that's the problem. If you're importing from your own affiliates, you're not importing from competing companies. And it's competing countries that kick you in the butt and give you a productivity boost because then you've either got to improve you either got to reform or you die. The fact that Sony is having problems with Samsung and Apple is either going to get Sony's either going to fix its shop or it's going to die and then have to be replaced by somebody else. That may not be good for Sony, but it will be good for Japan's electronics industry and be good for Japan. So we have, and if you take all of the growth in Japan's imports, what we see is in the first half of the 2000s, 31%, about a third of all of the growth in Japan's manufacturing imports was from Japan's own affiliates in Asia rather than independent, country, independent companies. In the last half of the decade, from 206 to 212, that grew to half. So that Japan is really not taking advantage of the potential of the second unbundling, in my view, because it's too incestuous. It's importing from itself rather than availing itself of the opportunities. Now, the same thing is true if you look at inward foreign direct investment, which again is a terrific kick for productivity. General Motors would not believe that Toyota actually had a better system until Toyota created a joint venture with GM in California, NUMI it was called, right? They had stories about, well, Toyota workers were running around on roller skates and that's why they could produce so much. I mean, you wouldn't believe the stuff they believed, right? But then they saw in a GM plant where they had lots of sabotage and alcoholism and, and absenteeism and, and just messiness and lousy productivity. That same plant, those same workers, but with Toyota management, suddenly productivity zoomed, sabotage and machinery went down, absenteeism went down, alcoholism went down. Same workers, same plant. What's the difference? Management. And so that, therefore, by bringing in new companies, you get fresh ideas, fresh blood. You think in, outside the box. You get rid of this not invented here syndrome. It's a tremendous kick to growth. So again, what's going on in Japan? Well, again, compared to the other neighbors who try to reform at the same time, they were all very low. This is total cumulative inv inward foreign direct, direct investment over decades. And how much did it add up to a single year's GDP? Very, very low, 0.3% in Japan, 0.5% in India, 2% in Korea, minuscule. 
what we see is that in India and in Korea, it really zoomed upward, right? Now in double digits. In Japan, it improved, but 3.4% is not something to write home about. Now, Abe says we're going to double the ratio again. Well, Abe's got, Abe's got a lot of numbers. He's got a lot of numbers. I don't know if you guys are Marx Brothers fans, but there's a famous movie called Coconuts where Chico and, and Groucho are going to have a bet on a horse race, and Chico says, you say two, I say four. You say four, I say eight. I got plenty of numbers. Abe's got plenty of numbers. He's got goals, but no way to achieve those goals. It's nice to have a goal to double FDI, but if you have no way to achieve it, you've got a problem. And I hate to disagree with Jim, but actually I don't hate to disagree with him. I enjoy it. But I would argue that Abe's motivation for TPP was not to improve the economy. I would argue that his motivation to improve TPP, to, to join TPP, was to enhance the security relationship between Japan and the U.S. and to get the U.S. even more engaged in the Asian economy as part of the security stature. For that, he was willing to do some things, including having a fight with the farmers. Now, will he go ahead? Well, I've had a bunch of talks in Tokyo, and the pro-TPP people in Tokyo are feeling very pessimistic. Now, they like to blame the U.S. for all their problems, which is only half the story. But there is a problem, which is uh, TPA, or fast track, as they used to call it. Uh, unless people know that whatever agreement they sign is the one that Congress will vote yes or no, they're going to be very, very reluctant to negotiate. And it's a very good possibility that that vote will not even take place until after the midterm elections, because the Democrats don't want to lose the Senate. Well, why, any, why is any foreign country going to negotiate seriously, give their last and best offer? If, if they think Congress might treat this as a, as a floor rather than as the ceiling. So I think if the United States really wants TPP, the issue is with all the different battles Obama's got to fight, he's really got to pick and choose. How important is TPP to him? If it is important, he's really got to communicate that. And that's a problem. If he's not going to, then Abe, if he wants to pick a fight with the farmers or the other people who oppose the kind of reform that you need for TPP, he can win that fight. He's got the clout to do it. But why should he pay the political cost of that fight if he doesn't think at the end of the day he's going to get a deal with the U.S. that will be the final deal? So resistance in each country exacerbates the interests, the, the resistance in the other country. So either you're going to have a, vi a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle. And the fear is that delay, I, I agree, with you, uh, that this does not do well with age. And so that is, is, is a fear I have, that TPP would not work. And even if it is signed, will it really be used to reform Japan or just try to get some extra markets for some Japanese exporters? Now, quick notes on two other issues that Abe has talked about a reform. There's been this alleged big reform in farm, and I'm not going to go through the details because it'll put you to sleep even faster than anything Jim could have thought of. But I will say there's been this alleged fa big farm reform and I spoke to an uh, uh, official at the embassy of an agricultural exporting country, the, the Japanese embassy there, not, not the American embassy. And he said, all you need to know about this alleged farm reform is that it was supported by Japan agriculture. Japan agriculture is the lobby of the Japanese farmers. There are, more employ there are almost as many employees of this alleged cooperative, which does banking, all kinds of stuff, than there are actual real full-time farmers. And they're a big part of the LD, Liberal Democratic Party vote machine. They support this reform. Therefore, that's all you need to know. It wasn't reform. The other big issue is energy, electricity reform. Um, they're supposed to separate generation and transmission, which is important for reasons you don't even want to know. But in fact, the same utilities which have monopolies in each of their districts can own both halves. Thing is, we've seen reform in Japan. We've seen it when it worked. We know what it looks like. When they reformed retail with a large-scale retail store law, it unleashed all kinds of changes in retail and distribution, which improved productivity, lower consumer prices. We saw it in telecommunications, when people had equal access to the radio spectrum and, and, the, and the phone monopolies lines. And again, great burst of growth in telecom uh, and, and in Japanese innovation, which unfortunately the Japanese did not continue with, otherwise, otherwise there would have been a Sony iPod and iPad and Kindle but there isn't. 
But the point is it did unleash it. So we know what reform looks like in Japan. This is not it. Now, uh, I probably, let me just take two minutes to just the things that are missing, which are the long-term issues. The long-term issues of productivity, which are not even being talked about how to do it. There are a couple different issues involved. One is, why has consumer electronics fallen down in Japan? What, one thing we can see is everybody has said, gee, our problem is the yen. Well, the yen's now cheaper. The yen has depreciated by 24%. It means it's gotten that cheaper. They can charge lower prices if they want to. But the real volume of exports from Japan in, in the 15 months since this has happened has actually gone down. It's not, they've not been able to take advantage of it as opposed to the auto companies, which have been able to take advantage of it. The problem is there's not been a new Japanese company, a top leader in the top two dozen of electronics hardware manufacturers since 1946, when it was Sony and Casio. In the US, by contrast, if you look at the top couple dozen, a th a half of them were not in the Fortune 500 20, 15, 20 years ago. A third of them didn't even exist. So in the US, when IBM falls down on the job, Microsoft and, and, and Intel replace it. And when Microsoft and Intel fall down on the job, you get Facebook and Google. We churn, that's again, creative destruction. You don't have an atmosphere which allows companies to die and be replaced by better companies. And one of the reasons you don't is because you don't have a labor market and a social safety net which allows the people who are laid off to be reemployed elsewhere to have a safety net which takes care of them during the transition, retrains them, has unemployment compensation meant for, for long-term unemployment, matches employers and workers, what are called active, active labor measures, which say countries like Sweden spend up to 2% of GDP on. Japan spends almost nothing. And the corporate reform and the labor reform go together. You can't do one without the other. The problem with the third arrow, because I think this is the heart of Japan's growth problem, it's not what's in the third arrow that's bad or, or, or just you know, false. It's what's not even being discussed in the third arrow, which is this whole issue. All mentioned about labor reform is the big companies want to be able to lay off more workers with no way of how, how they get reabsorbed. That's not labor reform. That's more long-term unemployment. That's more drop in living standards. It's not reform. So my view is, is I will say, uh, perhaps minority view, I'm a lot more skeptical on Abenomics than a lot of people are, particularly those who want to sell you Japanese stocks. Um, but in the end, I, I, think it's, I think it's correct. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Thank you very much. All right. Is the microphone on? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, so we have about a little bit less than 30 minutes for uh, questions from the audience. So let me start with a question about energy policy. Uh, and this is for either of our speakers. Which way is Japan's energy policy going? Uh, what's a realistic policy that Japan could pursue in terms of declining its reliance on nuclear energy and possible collaboration with the U.S. on shale gas? Um, and as an addendum, is there a shale gas boom here in the United States has also been added? Okay, um, I, I'm not the expert of that field actually, but uh, I think that uh, um, still the energy issues are, are partially very emotional issues uh, because of Fukushima. And uh, the government is not quite ready to set up a sort of really long-term strategy very in a kind of solid way. But uh, uh, the median uh, opinion among economists is that uh, definitely, uh, um, I think we have to keep uh, nuclear energy at least in the short run and middle run. And in the long run issues, as uh, we have sort of set uh, uh, diversified uh, opinions actually. Uh, but so the shale gas and others, and that, that's certainly coming into a sort of a, a short run and middle run strategies. So. So that's uh, what we had. And also a part of energy uh, sector, uh, electricity se sector, uh, th this is uh, uh, going to be in reform so in some way. And the general di direction is, of course, a separation of generation and distribution. Uh, and the Japan did that to some extent, but still the separated portion is very, very small. So it doesn't really work like that. Uh, but we'd have, to, uh, we'd have to kill some vested interest and market power issues. 
and then uh, in, in order to keep uh, the efficiency and the stability of the uh, supply of energy. So, so that's a sort of general, te uh, general direction to go. But uh, uh, how to do that is a really a sort of uh, delicate uh, um, institutional design is needed. So I, th I think that a lot of uh, debate is going on, but I think it, it's still a, some time to uh, set up a sort of a middle and a long run strategies. Let me add a couple words on that. I think nuclear power um, really embodies a lot of the problems in Japan. You know, the utilities lied. They falsified safety records. There were, there were corrosion in the pipes. There were all kinds of problems. They lied. And the government helped them lie. And the same agency was responsible for both promoting nuclear power and, and, and monitoring the nuclear utilities which is really a recipe for disaster. You've got to have two different agencies. Right? Otherwise, you've got conflict of interest. They're still lying. The new, a new agency set up to regulate nuclear power found the reports of these radioactive leaks from this plant that blew up. The, the, the utility that runs it is still lying about how much radioactivity there was, how much this. And so the population has really lost their trust. Abe's got a problem. He's for nuclear power. The Japanese people are against it. He's trying, this is another case where he's trying to avoid a fight. You know, politics is about how you get political capital and where you choose to spend it. He would sort of like nuclear power to be able to be restarted without him getting any blame for it. It doesn't quite work that way. But in order for it to be restarted, you have to have trust in the people who are running it. And the people who are running it are not worthy of trust. Uh, in my opinion, some of them should be in prisons, in, uh, joining certain people from Wall Street who should be in prison, but that's another issue. But the point is they're not in either country. So we got a problem there, which is very, very hard to restart that, and you can't grow without energy. Now the shale gas, the Obama administration has finally, uh, it's taken its time, but it's finally approved four of the projects for exporting shale oil to Japan. That will begin flowing in 2000, the shale LNG, rather, I should say. The, will start flowing in 2017, the amount, if all of that LNG were used simply to help uh, generate electricity, that would generate as much as 20 nuclear reactors. So that's, that, that's quite a lot, out of, out of these to have 54, right? So that's a big chunk. That will help, but that's four years down the road. But, and this, as I said, I think this electricity reform is desperately needed. It's what we have instead of sham reform because these utilities are big funders of Abe's liberal democratic party, I just don't think it's a fight he, he chooses to have. It's something he'd rather say he's doing something than actually, than actually do it. Yeah, this is a sort of typical uh, opinion of uh, one camp, actually, and that's, uh, that's pretty convincing, partially at least. But, uh, but the median, median opinion, again, is uh, to keep, keep nuclear stuff uh, to some extent in the short run. So it's a sort of a, 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 a discussion going on in Japan. That's, that's what I understand. Okay, the next question is for Professor Kimura. For Japan to meet the TPP target of agricultural tariffs, what must happen? Farm consolidation or perhaps more agricultural price supports? What's your opinion on this? Uh, so what to do for agricultural sector, right? So right, in order for... Um, uh, I think that so they, uh, the, the Japan cannot really keep uh, tariffs for the whole uh, five major items. Uh, so they have to step into uh, sort of more trade liberalization at least. And uh, they, I, I'm not sure that they really uh, clear up all tariffs uh, for agricultural products. Th that may not be very likely, so to keep something. Uh, but uh, um, we, I, I think that we, we have to have some sort of uh, uh, further, further removal of tariffs definitely. Uh, in order to do that, uh, maybe we have to introduce more domestic subsidy or something. This is another way to uh, make, make things dirty, but uh, uh, that would be a sort of a necessary to go through uh, in, that, in this uh, political process. So that, that it really depends on the kind of products, not just sort of percentage of uh, tariff removal. Um, so the rice, uh, we have a lot of uh, economic inefficiency over there. But actually, that, and also the adjustment cost is not so high. But, uh, but the political cost is very high. Uh, in case of meat, uh, many stakeholders are coming in in the negotiation, the US and Australia. 
So, so definitely meat would, be, would have a much more advanced uh, trade liberalization. Uh, sugar, dairy products, those are uh, actually uh, pretty, pretty sensitive for uh, the, the US too. So I don't know what would happen. Uh, wheat, uh, wheat is actually the state, state trade uh, in case of Japan. Uh, so the, the tariff uh, translation is about 200% uh, tariffs. So, uh, but the U.S. is having a pretty large share of uh, the uh, uh, in, inside the, uh, among uh, sort of imports of, of, of Japan too. So, so those are sort of uh, coming in uh, sort of in a uh, sort of dynamics of uh, negotiation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a sort of a free trade fundamentalist. I really hate to talk about that, but uh, uh, we may have some sort of compromise over there in the negotiations, I guess. The next question is for uh, Mr. Katz, and it's as follows. I understand your criticism, but what monetary and fiscal policy do you suggest? Okay, I think the monetary policy that's going on it would be fine if it were accompanied by a different sort of fiscal policy. Uh, so the problem that I have is the, is the illusion that monetary policy by itself can solve the problem. What you need, monetary policy just sort of creates financial instruments, doesn't really put money in the hands of people. In, an, in a country where you have positive interest rates, where the interest rates are four or five percent, monetary policy can lower interest rates and therefore people companies invest more, people buy more houses, more cars, where interest rates are already zero, it's really hard to get below zero. In fact, you can't get below zero. So there's nothing left to do. Keynes called it trying to push on a string. So what you need to do is put money in the hands of people, which is to say instead of raising taxes right now, eventually you'll have to raise taxes. But I would do that after the economy has been, has been a very good recovery state. Right now, in fact, I would cut taxes. I would spend money on the right kind of public works. For example, there are so many homes that are not connected to sewage lines, so they use these uh, cesspools, which are very polluting. One of the largest lakes in Chiba Prefecture, for example, is horribly polluted because of all the runoff. I think in California, cesspools have actually been banned now because of those pollution issues. There are a lot of people who are not connected toward, to, to gas lines, so they have these trucks driving with propane tanks. Again, the trucks polluting the air. Well, you know, if you could actually spend some money improving that kind of, of infrastructure, it would, it would save the country money in the long term in terms of how much gasoline does it need, how many, how many times do you have to rebuild roads. Of course, the construction lobby likes to rebuild roads. Um, it would solve a lot of problems. There's all kinds of things you could do that would be worth, worthwhile, would put money in people's pockets, and then the monetary policy would make sure that you don't have the problem that you sometimes get with fiscal policy, which is when you have fiscal stimulus, it can raise interest rates. So monetary policy would make sure, and that sort of you know, undercuts the strength of the fiscal stimulus. So you, interest rates can remain uh, down. There's a scare story being told by the finance ministry in the Bank of Japan, Japan that Japan could be the next Greece. It ain't so. It just ain't so. Japan, all the countries in Europe that got into trouble had not only big government debt, but big foreign debt. And so the foreigners took their money away and the countries collapsed. Japan does not have foreign debt. So Japan can go years and years with the kind of debts it has. It's got room. And then once you do have to raise taxes, I think there are much better taxes to raise than uh, the consumption taxes. Just one, one example, just for, you know, I just, like I tons, but just in the interest of time. There's a lot of alleged farmland. It's fake farmland in urban areas that people get huge tax breaks on. They don't grow food. They grow tax breaks, and they grow votes for politicians. <laughs> if you really want to give a tax break for real farmers, if that's what you want to do, fine. But let's not give them for fake farmers, for people who earn 80% of their income doing non-farming, or people who have gardens that you let other people you know, pay them to use and for their leisure time, and give them a tax break. That would raise a lot of money. Have a taxpayer ID system, so you much less tax evasion, like most countries, rich countries do. That would raise a lot of money. There's all kinds of things you can do before you get to consumer taxes. So I hope that helps to begin to answer the question. But you have to do both together. Neither by itself solves the problem. No, both are necessary. Neither by itself is sufficient. 
The next topic regards demographics. We have two questions. The first is, how is Japan dealing with the aging population and the overall reduction in population of the younger generation? Uh, and the second question is, if women in Japan work versus staying uh, at home, will that offset the decline of aging of the workforce? I'm sorry, if, if women do? Uh, have greater workforce participation. Right. Well, that, well, that off offsets the decline okay. in the uh, aging uh, population. Uh, I think that uh, the declining population, so people are too pessimistic sometimes, uh, because uh, the decrease in uh, the aging is very slow. We just have only one, one year older than, uh, than last year. So, uh, so changes in the labor force uh, versus the population uh, in a kind of transition period. Uh, labor population is a uh, labor force is uh, decreasing a little bit faster than population, so that's why labor force divided by population is uh, declining. But this is a sort of transition period, and moving that very slowly. So, so right now, so the Jap Japanese economy's uh, growth rate is very, very low, so that's why we do care. But uh, so once we, we, can see, we can say grow, say, say 2% or 2.5%, then actually that, that portion is very small. So, so people are so pessimistic, and the population decrease is coming in. Uh, but uh, so I think that this is a really slow process, and we have to adjust that. So, and also the uh, female uh, labor participation, definitely we have to promote that. But in order to do that, we have to, uh, we have to do, so, uh, t take care of, uh, sort of uh, uh, say, family life and other things. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the female workers cannot come into uh, uh, the labor force. So, so now it's so just a sort of a relatively unskilled type of labor, uh, a labor spot uh, is filled by female workers. But uh, we have a lot of educated female work, potential female workers too, so we have to have a sort of environment that, that that kind of people can work. So it's a sort of a thing, I don't know, so that, that would feel a sort of decreases in uh, uh, population. And usually, the changes in the labor participation ratio is very, very slow, so, uh, say, in, in the experience of other countries. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that, that really kills, uh, sort of, uh, kill off a sort of uh, the speed of decrease. But uh, th there is a lot of potential for utilizing uh, female workers, definitely. Let me answer something on that as well. Um, I think one of the big problems with aging is that the total population is declining even faster than the working age population. So that instead of having, you know, 10, 10 working age people for every retiree, and then you went down to five, and now I think it's about two and a half, and I think it'll be about one and a half, I forget, in one year. So you've got fewer and fewer people having to support more and more of the aged. And that puts tremendous strain on budgets, on all kinds of, on all kinds of things. Now, Again, this is an issue that's not really even being discussed in any serious way. One of the things that was sold as labor flexibility was a system of so-called irregular workers. These are part-timers and temporary workers, as opposed to the, the lifetime employment system for which Japan has been famous. So you're getting these two, two tiers of work, workers, the sort of the, the people with the job security and the people without. Now, it was 20 years ago, the number of irregular workers in the economy was about 15% of all workers. Now it's 37%. There was job growth in the last year. Every single new job created or on net was for irregular workers. The number of regular workers fell again. Now irregular workers not only get 30% or 40% less per hour, but they don't get the benefits of some of the, of the pension things, of the bonuses, which are a big part of income. And what happens is, among men, 30, men in their 30s in Japan, those who are regular workers, 75% of them are married and have children. Among those who are, are, who are irregular, only 25% are married. That's not being discussed at all in the third era. Now look at women. I have met so many uh, attractive, pleasant, educated, really sharp, really interesting women. Not one-on-one, -on -one, I assure you. But I have met them, and single. And why are they single? Well, they want to have careers. And they would like to have a family and be married and have two children. Actually, they want 2.4 children. They get to have about 1.36 children if they get married, right? 
but they all face often at the workforce what's called maternity harassment, which is they get pregnant, and they're sort of asked to leave, and they drop off of any elite track they've been on. Now, countries like Sweden and France have found that, in fact, women who have got satisfying uh, careers, educated women who've got satisfying careers, actually end up having more children than the stay-at-homes. They, they want both. And they're being made to choose either or in Japan. For all of Abe's talks about womanomics, not a word about this. This is, again, why I say it's, it's, it's too much tatamai and not enough hone. But I think there is a serious demographic problem. It needs to be addressed. It's basically really part of the growth problem. And if you don't address this, you're, you're not going to revive the economy. And unfortunately, I, I don't feel it's being addressed. I think Professor Kimura wants to follow yeah, up. He said that point. those kind of issues are not discussed. But it's, it's not uh, true, actually. That's a, the that's a heart of uh, the reform program, actually. They have to talk about it. We have a lot of discussion. Well, what is Abe saying about it? To do about any of these issues? I don't, I don't follow all Abe's uh, statements, actually. I'm, saying, I'm not saying but it's not being discussed is, in Japan. I'm saying it's not being discussed by Abe as part of his third arrow. Other people are discussing it needs to be done. I'm just saying he's not proposing no, 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 as part no. of his in, reform. In the research team, yes, they are talking about that. But you, you don't really follow the, the news. I don't, I, I really <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you know what? A lot of things happen. And there's a, in Japan, you have these advisory councils and there's the advisory committees. And they have a lot of independent people. And they also have bureaucrats. And a lot of things get discussed. And then reports come out. And then recommendations come out. And then the cabinet decides what to do about it. And between what's discussed by really smart, insightful people in these research teams, what eventually gets approved by the political team in the prime minister's office is a ver and the bureaucrats in between is a very different kettle of fish. I'm quite well aware of the brilliant discussions in some of these teams. I'm also aware of the gap between that and what the prime minister okay. has actually proposed. I, I okay. agree that the reform team is uh, always have to fight with uh, bureaucrats in many cases. And then how they can go through is a, really a sort of political leadership. So I'm not sure that Abe can do this or not. In the past, uh, many, many uh, prime ministers couldn't do that. Uh, but, uh, but at least uh, we, we, have, we are trying to make something better. And you just said that doing nothing, uh, uh, that, that doesn't really help us. OK, we have um, some more questions, so maybe we should move on to a less controversial topic, uh, <laughs> which would involve uh, Yasukuni and the Senkakus, uh, actually. So um, how has Prime Minister Abe's nationalistic adventurism, such as Yasukuni and uh, the Senkakus, impacted Japan's economic prospects uh, in the next few years? Uh, so, uh, effects are already there. Uh, actually, uh, the after, after Senkaku, uh, so we, we had a lot of uh, non-tariff barriers in China. Uh, say so Japanese companies are exporting some parts and components, and suddenly uh, customs officers stop uh, passing uh, the, those kind of products, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, actually, many Japanese companies are feel uncomfortable in uh, doing business in uh, China compared with in, in the past. So, so the effects are already there. Uh, but of course, uh, China is a big market. Uh, so good business opportunities are there. There are already a lot of uh, production sites and others are there. So, so there's the no, no way for Japanese companies to withdraw 100%. But the new investment is very slowing down in coming into China. So, so I think that the effects are already there. Uh, I'm an economist. Uh, I, I try not to talk about uh, some political issues. <laughs> uh, but the effects are there, definitely. Uh, so that's a really unfortunate. I would actually, uh, to be shameless in advertising myself, uh, if you look at the Foreign Affairs website, I have a piece called Why Chinese-Japanese Economic Relations Are Improving. And what's happened is the Chinese try to use economic boycotts of Japan as a weapon to get their way on the Senkaku's dispute. And what the Chinese learned is, in fact, they need to buy what Japan has to sell them. They cannot produce iPhones without Toshiba flash drives. All kinds of other things. They can't produce elevators that don't fall down without buying them from exhibitions for other people. So in fact, the, what they're trying to do is, in the Chinese government side, is actually delink their hardline and security affairs from their renormalizing economic ties. So that's a good thing to read on that. I do think the danger of, of, of Abe you know, going to Yasukuni and talking about you know, glorification of the 1930s when he was grandfather and all this stuff is Japan's not going to remilitarize, 
But it can, first on the security side, it takes some of the very common sense things, things that he wants to do, collective self-defense, uh, the National Security Council, very common sense things, and it contaminates them by associating them with basically defending you know, war crimes and defending aggression. And therefore undermines the ability to do these very common sense things in what's becoming a very dangerous neighborhood. The other fear on the economic side is that, again, it's politics. How do you gain political capital and where do you choose to spend it? My fear is that not all of Abe's team, but Abe himself, because he, he, he went against his advisors when he went to Yasukuni. They told him not to go, most of them is that he, Abenomics, the hope that will succeed is why Abe's approval ratings are so high. But then you, if you actually want to really do the reforms, you've got to spend it by having fights with the vested interests who don't want those reforms. Is he going to spend it on that? Or is he going to spend it on going to Yasukuni and a state secrets bill and say, well, the army didn't really force people into prostitution and the Nanjing massacre didn't really, I mean, is that really what the Prime Minister of Japan should be doing? And the fear is he's taking his eyes off the ball. And it is his primary focus should be, let's revive Japan economically, because it's also one of the most important things he could do to help the security situation of Japan and the region. That is the danger. Whether that danger will come to fruition or, or not, I don't know. But that's the fear that people worry about. And the, uh, here's a question from Mr. Katz. It's about your chart that you put up. The trade GDP comparison of Japan versus India and Korea does not seem appropriate as India and Korea are at different stages of economic development. Do you have any comment? Uh, sure. Um, if you look across the world, um, while the state of economic development has got some relationship to trade and GDP ratios, I'm not sure if the person asking the question thinks that less developed countries have a smaller GDP trade GDP ratio or a higher one. Most trade in the world is actually between rich industrialized countries. They tend to trade more or countries that are in the process of becoming industrialized like the tigers of Asia, you know, like Ireland, like Poland, etc. One of the biggest uh, indicators of, of trade and GDP is population, therefore how self-sufficient you can be. And so as I said, I chose countries that were smaller and, and larger. Uh, uh, yes, India is a lot poorer than Japan. Korea, on the other hand, according to the IMF, in four years, the GDP per capita, the real GDP per capita adjusted for differences in price levels in Korea will be equal to that in Japan. Korea is now virtually at the same level of economic development as Japan. And one of the reasons that Korea is doing so well relative to Japan, I believe, is because it has embraced globalization in a way that Japan has yet to do. So I think it's an entirely appropriate chart. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rick Katz, uh, Professor Kimura, thank you for the spirited discussion. And uh, Gene, thank you for keeping things in control. Let's give them a one-bear round of applause. I have a lot of questions for you. Uh